Former New Jersey Governor Jim Florio, who was the force behind the nation's landmark Superfund law, died Sunday. He was 85. I'm Jordan Gospore, and this is Hazard and Jay, a show that obviously wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Florio and the Superfund Act. But we can all thank him for making New Jersey and the rest of the country a little bit cleaner. We had planned to release a new episode this week, but after the news broke of Florio's death, we decided to reflect on his life and legacy instead. In 1975, when Jim Florio joined the U.S. House of Representatives, New Jersey was a dumping ground for chemical and industrial waste. Florio would spend the next few years trying to clean it up. New Jersey, historically, when people like Governor Florio came to power, were not that concerned with New Jersey's environment. And we had a lot of well-deserved reputation for not taking care of our environment and sort of, you know, having lots of old industrial sites that we weren't taking care of, lots of legacy pollution that we weren't taking care of, bad air quality, If you, you know, America drove down the turnpike, right? You know, that was what people knew about New Jersey. That's Micah Rasmussen. He's the director of the Rebovich Institute for Politics at Ryder University and has been working in politics professionally since 1992. Governor Florio was part of the change in attitude that led to New Jersey taking care of itself. And really one of the things that to this day, New Jersey prides itself on is that we do have a good environment. We do have good air quality. We do have good water quality at this point, but those are things that didn't happen on their own and they didn't happen without people like Governor Florio. Florio's efforts would result in the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation and Liability Act. This was enacted in 1980 and became more commonly known as the Superfund Law. It's a bill that forces polluters, not taxpayers, to pay for the cleanups of toxic sites across the country. And the other members of the Congress, as well as the president of this administration, I think you'd all be very proud of what we've done in this very crucial area. Not just this legislation, but really to address the whole problem of the inappropriate disposal of toxic materials. Really, that's a two-part problem. Uh, prospectively, we have a new regulatory system which is just going into effect now, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and therefore we should have no new love canals being uh, created. And this bill, of course, is the second part, which is to go back and clean up what unfortunately has been done over the last number of years. Florio had already dealt with New Jersey's long history of pollution as an assemblyman in Trenton. So in Congress, he modeled the bill after New Jersey's own spill act which was passed four years before the Superfund law and required polluters to pay for their messes. Getting the Superfund Act passed wasn't easy. Florio's South Jersey district was home to some of the state's biggest polluters. But Micah says that didn't deter Florio. The Superfund is something that even to this day is controversial because it requires a way to pay for these cleanups. And it requires a way to pay for cleanups where there's not a responsible party. It's never been an easy path forward, but it needed to be done. We needed a way to pay for this stuff. Over the next four decades, the Superfund program would go through a lot of ups and downs. Cleanup in some places dragged for decades, partly because of funding cuts and court battles with polluters. That's left many of these sites still contaminated. New Jersey has the most Superfund sites out of any state in the country with 115. Many of them have been on the list since the program was founded in 1980. Only 36 in New Jersey have been cleaned and removed from the list. In, in my view, at least, and I think this is a fair statement, that we had the most Superfund sites because we counted them. I think other states didn't count them and say, you don't count them, you don't have them. That's Edward Lloyd, director of the Environmental Law Clinic at Columbia Law School. He worked with then-Congressman Florio on the New Jersey Spill Compensation and Control Act, the state predecessor to the Superfund law. As someone who was born in the 90s, it's kind of impossible for me to think about where we'd be without the Superfund, especially when you hear stories like this from Doug O'Malley, the director of Environment New Jersey. There was a mentality of midnight dumping, and this wasn't just a problem in New Jersey. There was midnight dumping going on everywhere, but especially in New Jersey with our industrial past. We are an industrial state. We are still living with that industrial legacy, but you know, in the 1970s, that industrial legacy was alive and well, and how you got rid of the waste. Um, you know, we are still living with that consequence today. The Superfund tax on chemical and oil companies expired in 1995. This tax helped pay for cleanups at orphan sites. 
These are toxic places where the polluter is unknown or unable to pony up the funds to clean up the mess. The tax was reinstated this past August as part of President Biden's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That's great news, and you can listen to the Hazard and Jay episode all about it. Florio got to see the Superfund tax reinstated. His environmental legacy has come full circle. Doug remembers him as someone who was forward-thinking and cared deeply about the state of New Jersey. There are too many Superfund sites in the state. We need more cleanup. We need to enforce the Clean Water Act. We need to have an environment that's here, not just for this generation, but the next. That's something that Jim Florio got, and that's something that we need to kind of take that baton and carry it with us. Me and producer Michael Saul Warren met Florio at his home in May. And I have to admit, I was a little nervous. I was meeting one of the authors of the Superfund law. The law is a big deal. I imagine if you're listening to this podcast, you understand why. Florio spoke with us about the history of the Superfund, what life was like when people could just dump toxic waste into someone's backyard, and some of the ways these sites can be remediated once they're cleaned up. Here's some of that interview. Governor, why don't we start from the beginning? What drew you or, or what connection do you have to environmental issues and pollution yeah. in general? Well, I was very much involved in Congress. I was the chairman of the authorizing committee that dealt with environmental matters. I was on the Energy and Commerce Committee, the subcommittee uh, dealt with environmental matters. And so I was the chairman of that committee and we got a lot of things done. But the more important reason was that there were really problems on the surface in the state and in my congressional district. It was a fact then, it's still a fact now, we have more Superfund sites in New Jersey than any other state. And I had them more in my congressional district than any other congressional district. So we had that. And that, by the way, flows from the history of New Jersey. That most people don't know it, but up until 1950 or so, New Jersey was the center of the chemical and the petrochemical industry. And in those days, there was no environmental concerns, so people just went had uh, industrial development and uh, things were just randomly disposed of. And then we ended up drinking the stuff that was randomly disposed of. So we had, and again in the 70s, this was under the Carter administration, there was real heightened sensitivity to all these problems. Uh, there was Love Canal, the whole town was moved. Uh, we had a whole bunch of different things happening. Rachel Carson wrote a book uh, Silent Spring, which is a bestseller, and people were very concerned about the consequences of not having dealt for a hundred years. I mean, ever since the uh, Civil War, industrialism, industrialism took place, and uh, nobody was sensitive to the environmental consequences. So all that sort of surfaced at one time. Some of the hostility that we had came from the chemical industry and the petrochemical industry, who were the, the key people, one of the principles we built into the law was that the polluters should pay. That would be the mantra, and it was. And we actually well levied attacks on the chemical and petrochemical companies that went into the Superfund. You started to talk there a bit about the district you represented. Obviously, district lines change over time. Can yeah. you tell us about um, you know what what communities you were representing when yeah. you were in Congress? Essentially, really, this this district hasn't changed that much. Camden County, Gloucester County, later on had a little piece of Burlington County, but it was a, a district that was industrial. RCA was a big producer. Campbell Soup was a big producer of jobs. Uh, a lot of chemical people, people dealing with dirty products, just disposing of things. So we had a real problem, serious problem. And that provided me with some political dilemmas. At one point, I had, I'd have some of these environmental laws pass, and I find out that somebody put on the bulletin board at uh, RCA, Florio is going to jeopardize your job. Um, and that was really something that was difficult. And I had to go call, had town meetings. People would show up and say, you know, I work here, and this is on the bulletin board. What's the answer? I said, well, you know, all of you uh, work wherever you work, but you also drink water, you also breathe air, you have children, and therefore you have to balance the type of thing. And then really, the, the, the tax that we put on the, the chemical people, the pitcher people, was minuscule from this standpoint. So after a while, it got to be very acceptable. At the outset, though, it was a little difficult. Yeah. 
Was there any uh, particular site in uh, in Camden or 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 Gloucester yeah. counties that stuck out to you as like we need to get that? The number up? one site in the nation for, for a while was something called the Lapari Landfill in Gloucester, Gloucester County. There was Gems Landfill in Gloucester Township. There was a Price's Pit, which is uh, down in Atlantic City. It was a pollution that was headed towards the aquifer. And when we got to the aquifer, you'd have bad water for the half, half of South Jersey. So there were, there were these startling places that uh, we, we do call. Love Canal, everyone knows about. Times Beach, Missouri is another one. It was, uh, they, had to, they had to close up the whole town. So there were things that got your attention. Yeah. When it came time to actually sit down and, and write Circle, or write the Superfund Law, uh, what was that process like? Who, who were you working closely with and, and yeah. um, was it difficult? Well, the environmentals, uh, most of the people who learned about this, I mean, you, you have, almost have to be brain dead not to feel you should do something about this situation which is bulging all over the place. And the difficult people we had were some ideological people who just said government shouldn't be doing any of this sort of thing. And then you had the chemical people, petrochemical people, they were very hostile, but when we call on people to vote for it, it was just a no-brainer. Uh, people just all s supported that. And we would learn how to mobilize people in different areas. If Congressman Jones was a pain in the neck, and we, John Congressman Jones had a site in his district, we got and made contact with the people who lived next to the site. They talked to Congressman Jones, and lo and behold, he held his nose and voted yes. When we look at environmental issues, particularly in Congress today, uh, with things, uh, bills trying to address climate change and whatnot, much less bipartisanship, right? It is much more fractured. Do you think that if you were in Congress today and, and facing this issue, uh, you would have been able to get Superfund through? I think, I think so, because I sort of engage, or try to get people to engage in the merits of talking about what you're talking about, and not be having rigid ideological lines. I don't know if you could do it or not, but that would be my approach to try to do something. And uh, align people's interests with their interests and the issues they're trying to deal with. So uh, I think I might be, but, but uh, who knows? I mean, it's a, it's a tough mentality that you have to deal with in some instances. Yeah. Now, once, once the process was done and, and the law was signed, were you surprised at all by the sheer number of sites that ended up being included on the Superfund list. I mean, in New Jersey, there seemed to be a wave in 83. Yeah. No, that, that didn't surprise me. I followed the formula that they formed in form, you know, the qualified Superfund. What surprised me was the ra rapid change between, because this was done on the very end of the Carter administration. And within 30 days, we had a full sense that the new people coming in under President Reagan, uh, were clearly not sympathetic to what we were doing, and in fact was overtly hostile, saying this should be a three, a four-year law and it should expire. We shouldn't be doing any of this sort of thing. And uh, the woman who was in charge of EPA, actually, ironically enough, is the Supreme Court Justice's mother, Gorsuch. Yeah. Of course, she was at that point she was Anne Gorsuch. Then she got married again, and she had Anne Burford. But she was the person in charge of EPA, and she clearly stated she didn't believe in the law. And we had actually almost six years, four years of Reagan and the first two years of Bush, of people who were overtly hostile to the law, saying they didn't want to spend the money. In fact, they didn't end up spending the money. They allowed the monies that we raised from the chemical industry, the petrol companies, to expire, and they ran out of money, which is half of the problem we have now. Because the money comes now from the taxpayer, and so you are always arguing for less money coming, I mean, less taxes. So it was wise for us to put the burden of the cost onto the industry that caused the problems. Now what we're doing is we're having the taxpayers pay for the tax. Yeah, when Superfund was passed, was there a sense that Reagan was going to come around and, and undo it all and? You needed to hurry? Well, I don't think there was really enough knowledge to fully get engaged, people engaged. I mean, 
at this point, no one was really looking for things. It was only about a year or two later, nothing's being done. And the answer was, yeah, nobody wants to do anything. So nobody brings any actions because the people in charge of the whole process at this point don't believe in the process. So you, you leave Congress, you go to become governor and then on to uh, a career in law. As you have sat kind of from the outside these past few decades, what have been your feelings on how Superfund has evolved over time? Well, it's evolved in a meaningful way, but not accomplishing a lot because you had people who were throwing sanity in the gears. President Clinton wanted to do things, but Newt Gingrich got elected in midterm and got rid of the money. It just said no money, money for this, this program. So that was the difficult thing. If you have ideal opposition, you can, you can grind everything to a halt. And that's what's happened on many, many occasions. Yeah. Are you optimistic that, that, um, that there can be a renewed sense of urgency around cleaning up these sites? Yeah, I think I, I am. If people are moderate in their expectations. There have been sites that have been cleaned up, um, and that's good, um, but it's just it's, it's the exception. New Jersey has about, I think, 113 sites now. We only have tw 20 counties, so that roughly you talk about 20 sites per county. That's a, a serious problem. A number of Superfund sites have been cleaned up. Uh, but a number remain in limbo, right? Yeah. I think a, a large majority of them remain yeah. in limbo. The, the mantra has always been the polluter pays, right? But now that we're seeing some sites going on 40 years of not being cleaned up in part because we're waiting for the polluter to pay, mm -hmm. do you think that it would be appropriate for the program to shift a bit and be more uh, willing to spend public money first and recoup the cost later? Well, it's a matter of degree. I mean, the whole concept was you'd have the super fund there, and what you'd do is you'd go locate a site, locate the people who are responsible for it, then bring an action against them to make them pay. Sometimes you couldn't find the person who caused the problem. Other times you find them and they were bankrupt, they had no resources whatsoever, so that's when the fund would be used. The fund would be used for preliminary material before you get the polluter, because the polluters rarely voluntary clean up, they have to litigate to, to clean up. But the, the fund being used for the purpose exclusively is offensive to me, but, um, but it should be used. First and foremost, public safety is important. So cleaning up the stuff as opposed to litigating it for years. You mentioned uh, earlier the sheer number of sites New Jersey has. I think if the Hackensack River gets accepted, we'll be up to 115. Obviously, a, a part of that is that a state has to seek uh, to have a site listed. Um, are you surprised that other states haven't been as aggressive as New Jersey has in, in putting their sites on the list? It depends on the local situation. I mean, whoever's in charge of the business economy can dictate whether you cooperate or you don't cooperate. And many of these people don't, don't cooperate. New Jersey is fairly aggressive in making sure people do the right thing, but I mean, lots of examples. I mean, Texas is a place where I suspect nobody is really overly sensitive at all to uh, this type of thing. Yeah. I'm just curious if when you wrote Superfund and, and it was signed into law, if you imagined that 40 years later you'd be waiting for uh, hundreds of the sites in your state to be cleaned up still. No, I, I wouldn't have imagined it. I would have thought it could move more quickly. I was... Um, well, I, I was shocked by the Reagan. I mean, the woman who uh, was uh, in charge, I mentioned her, Gorsuch, she almost got impeached. She was about to be impeached and she resigned. The woman who was in charge of the Superfund, Rita Lavelle was her name. She went to jail. Perjury and conflicts of interest. Uh, so, I mean, so, so you had people didn't really believe in the mission and were trying to thwart the mission. So that. That didn't surprise me that they didn't get a whole lot of progress because it wasn't until the first President Bush's his second half, after the first two years, he appointed somebody to EPA um, who was fairly good. Uh, prior to that, nobody had been in charge of those offices that was even committed to what they were supposed to be doing. So there's a large chunk of, of 
lost years at a time when there would have been yeah. the most momentum. The first six years were counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still, would you say we're still digging out of that hole? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it, Governor. Hazard and Jay is honoring the legacy of Jim Florio and his passion to not just clean up toxins in New Jersey, but the entire country. He will be missed. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Hazard and Jay. This time we're staying in South Jersey, Jim Florio's turf, the land of the Jersey Devil and the place where salt water is creeping ominously higher. Hazard is a space not just for learning about Superfund sites, but for engaging our communities in conversation around the cleanup of these toxic places. Do you have questions about Superfund sites in New Jersey? Do you live near one? If so, I want to hear from you. Send me a tweet using hashtag HazardNJ, or leave me a voice memo at hazard at myNJPBS.org. We may play your comments in a future episode. Hazard and Jay is an NJ Spotlight News production. The show is written, edited, and hosted by me, Jordan Gosporé. Jamie Kraft is the executive producer with NJ Spotlight News. Our executive in charge of production is Joe Lee. Michael Saul Warren is our associate producer. Chris Panza is our production assistant. Chloe Matisi is our production manager. Music for Hazard and Jay was composed by Nick Pennington. Artwork by Matthew Fleming. Support for Hazard and Jay is provided by Peril and Promise, a public media reporting initiative covering the human stories of climate change and its solutions, with major funding provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagelos and Diana T. Vagelos. You can learn more at pbs.org forward slash Peril and Promise.